My next guest is Brad Hughes. Brad is an elementary school principal with 25 years experience in education. He is currently at Forest Hill Public School in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, designated a hero generation school in the Waterloo Region District School Board. Prior to becoming a school leader, Brad taught for 16 years in classrooms from kindergarten to eighth grade, most recently teaching middle school visual arts, French and special education. Brad is a certified self-reg school champion and has an ongoing commitment to reframing the joys and challenges of school life through a self-reg lens. Brad and his wife, Jennifer, are proud parents of a son and daughter, both in university. Brad describes himself as an optimist and recovering perfectionist who is passionate about improving the lives of kids by loving and supporting the adults that serve them. Welcome to the podcast, Brad. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for the invitation. Well, it's great to have you on today. Well, tell me a little time about when you were in the trenches or how um, maybe this moment in time is currently in the trenches and how you're working through um, starting school back up during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. You're absolutely right, Dana. And uh, on uh, Tuesday, September the 8th, uh, we're going to be welcoming um, uh, tens of thousands of students uh, in the province of Ontario back to school face to face. Uh, many families are going to uh, have their kids uh, returning uh, at a distance learning uh, scenario. Uh, but for the most part, uh, 70 to 80 percent of our students will be welcomed back to school for the first time since March the 13th. And if, if there was ever an in the trenches moment, I, I think we are we are heading straight into it. And it reminds me of, you know, um, when you think of uh, our armed forces colleagues that uh, that uh, time was they were in the trenches they were uh, they were facing unknown adversaries uh, only with their either their basic training or with whatever experience uh, they were able to accumulate uh, on the job uh, and and our uh, educators uh, principals superintendents and school board uh, leadership are all in the same position we're, we're facing um, so much unknown uh, but we're drawing on our basic training and we're also drawing on uh, our relationship and our, our uh, empathetic skills so we can move forward. We're, we're not, we don't want to be in a position, uh, although it's understandable, where our colleagues and parents feel that we are, we are pushing them out over the trench mm -hmm. um, while we remain back and, and see what happens and, and hope for the best but plan for the worst. In fact, uh, it, it's got to be our commitment uh, as school leaders, as educators, uh, as anyone involved with public education to stand and, and, and face these unknowns shoulder to shoulder uh, with our kids, with our colleagues, with our parents. Uh, so much information and so many solutions are only going to emerge after we've begun. So uh, as long as we know where to start and, and we start with compassion, we start with, uh, with love and understanding for what people may have experienced. If we start with, uh, you know, we, we position ourselves as, as listeners and learners to what people's experiences have been. And then we seek then to help people understand how our new normal of back to school is going to begin, how it's going to emerge. So this is absolutely an in the trenches moment. This is a, a pivotal moment, uh, likely the most significant challenge that any of us have, as educators have ever faced um, across North America, whether kids are returning face to face, whether they're returning at a distance. Um, we as educators have a responsibility and really a, a tremendous opportunity to, to frame uh, and to support kids and families as positively uh, and as safely as possible. Well, I really love how you uh, use that analogy of the soldiers. Um, you know, they're facing unknown adversaries, right? And uh, right now we're facing an unknown enemy or the invisible, that's not unknown, but it's an invisible enemy, right? And we, we don't really know when the enemy is going to go away when um, and how strongly the enemy is going to attack, right? Because it's, it's unpredictable with the waves of, um, you know, test cases going up and down. Um, but I, I really, um, you know, take heart to the fact that you want to use love and understanding, right? You talked a lot in the pre-chat about uh, some of these uh, diverse, um, uh, in your school setting, you have a lot of um, second language learners. Uh, you have students with a lot of economic needs. Um, and um, your school is like a community hub. So what are some specific, specific strategies uh, that you're, um, you're working with your staff on now um, as you guide the community uh, through the COVID crisis in your area and into this coming school year? 
there, there's a sort of a twofold foundation for me, and that's looking backwards and then looking forward. So we look back on the relationships that we invested in uh, with our kids, with our families, with our colleagues, um, and we place significant emphasis on relationships here at Forest Hill and within our school board as a whole. Um, we know that nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm going to say all of the good things that occur within a school are founded on positive relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and when there is a, uh, a challenge that we need to work through, um, we draw on uh, the emotional bank account, we draw on the trust, and we draw on the positive experiences that we've had to weather us through challenging times. So our, our number one concern right now is to uh, be committed to rekindling all of those relationships that served us so well in the past, knowing that people, kids, families, educators are all returning uh, to classrooms um, with, with their alarms on here trigger. I mean, uh, for the past uh, almost six months, uh, we've been facing uh, health crises in our communities, in our homes, uh, in our long-term care centers, in our hospitals, um, and everyone is naturally very understandably very wary uh, and very on the lookout for, uh, for danger and, and, and sort of in self-preservation mode. So in order to help people over that hump and to see that um, you know, if we are to reestablish schools as places of safety, as, as they always were before, uh, before the impact of COVID, uh, we have to rekindle those relationships. And, and I'm really hopeful that uh, sort of the collective breath that all of us are holding as educators and as parents is going to be slowly released as we come back to face to face and say, yeah, we're going to work together. We're going to figure this out. Um, so, you know, levering, leveraging the relationships is, is going to be key. The other key thing that is going to be our, our, our clarion, our rallying call for staff is that there's natural, uh, there's natural um, apprehension on the part of educators and on the part of parents about learning loss and how is my kid ever going to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we want to strongly remind our, uh, our educators and our families is that we're going to welcome each and every student back exactly where they are, recognizing that each of them has had a different COVID journey, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, we need to acknowledge and understand that all of us have experienced different layers of trauma, uh, depending on our, our personal experiences, on our community experiences. And we just need to focus on where we're at first, uh, finding out what we've experienced, what our needs are, uh, before we can move forward. And, and there, there's, there's no need certainly at the outset uh, for additional apprehension about catching anybody up to where we think they should be. All we need to do is start where we are. Uh, kids just want to know that their teachers and their friends are there for them. Parents want to know that their schools and teachers and principals are there for them. And once we, we've established that, uh, once we have our footing underneath us and once we sort of grow into uh, new routines and, and, um, and new protocols, uh, then we can begin to address what each student needs in terms of his or her learning exactly as we did before COVID. Yeah, and I, I really like how, you know, you frame that and it's what we've been saying ever since March, uh, Maslow before Bloom and um, showing empathy. Uh, we talked a lot in the pre-chat about uh, showing empathy and, um, you know, being positive as a school leader, but also be real, right? Because uh, we're not only um, facing the challenges or helping our students with the challenges and they're coming back with those various traumas, but we're also um, supporting our staff as well um, that, that have been through a variety of things that may have lost loved ones. Um, so uh, how can you help uh, your colleagues and your staff in uh, situations um, when they're feeling down and when they're feeling like they can't make it through the day, um, how can you help them stay resilient um, through this time? And as you start school, I know we're kind of, Holding, like you said, we're holding this collective breath. And once you start, you know, we might get used to like the new normal. But um, as you as you prepare for the school year and, and they, they they have challenges uh, on their own, what 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 can you do to help them stay resilient? Well, just to go back to your point, it, it uh, positive but real is, is key mm -hmm. uh, because uh, all of us are sorting through information that is um, uh, that is changing and in many cases incomplete. Yeah. And so you want to be positive, but you don't want to go so far on the other side of just saying everything is rosy, everything is going to be okay. Um, because after a while, um, everything's going to be okay. And don't like, I'm going to say, I've heard no one in the history of worrying has ever worried less by being told, don't worry. 
Mm-hmm. Or no one in the history of calming down has been has been has been calmed by saying just calm down. Yeah. You have to acknowledge what people's apprehensions and people's questions are, um, and so you know the positivity but realness is as school, for for me as a school leader and for my colleagues, it's just acknowledging the tremendous importance of of being vulnerable, uh, mm-hmm. of sharing our own apprehensions. Um, leadership is not necessarily about um, the stiff upper lip uh, and um, uh, and reminding people to adhere to uh, policies, protocols, regulations. In fact, it, especially in times like this, um, it's about uh, vulnerability. It's about uh, letting people uh, see, feel, and hear your concerns. But but over, but even more importantly, it's it's leveraging the power of I know. Like in, in school leadership positions, you're often looked to as the person with the answers, mm-hmm. and often uh, depending on depending on how you approach leadership or how you approach support. Um, you put yourself in a position where you want to provide explanations or you want to provide, okay, here's what you do. In fact, you have to begin in these cases with the words, I know. You just have to hear people where they're at and, and, mm-hmm. and really empathize. Um, you're concerned about physical distancing. I know it's going to be a concern. Uh, you're, con- you're, going to be, you're, you're concerned about if or how kids are going to be successfully able to wear masks. I know Uh, it, it's, it's, it can be really tempting to jump in. I do this naturally in terms of personality type. I've got, I want to fix uh, but what I've learned more and more is it's way more important to seek to understand what people are thinking and feeling and to help them unpack the solutions along with them. Um, it also releases a tremendous amount of, of pressure on yourself as a school leader because, again, if we talk about back to the trenches, you're working shoulder to shoulder with people. Mm-hmm. Um, you're demonstrating through service. You're demonstrating through uh, the way you lead that you're, you're modeling the desired behaviors. I mean, this, you know, the desired behaviors in this case are coming together as a community um, and demonstrating as much flexibility and as much uh, resilience as possible. It's also really important to remember that resilience doesn't just happen. Uh, it, it's easy to, to, you know, to share with staff members a motivational poster or a, a kind of a, um, a feel-good video, but it's, it's essential to recognize that, that resilience and empathy, um, are, are they, they take a tremendous amount of energy from us. So, all of us are in a process of balancing uh, the internal and the external stresses that we can both uh, name uh, and that are unnamed um, and uh, coming to another person with empathy and, and maintaining your own resilience. Uh, it, it, it takes energy, it taps on your reserves. And so as school leader, I mean, the, I, I try to maintain that energy by, uh, by being present, by being real, by being positive. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, using a sense of humor Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I just enjoy, um, you know, I, I, I truly love my staff members and I, I love my, the, the kids. And uh, again, I just try to approach it with uh, that, um, that spirit of love. I'm here for you, um, first and foremost, as, as a human being, uh, as a colleague, as a friend. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the resilience can actually be restored if at least people know that others care. Uh, and that they care about them managing their energy. At this time, I'm encouraging all of my staff members, you know, in addition to the apprehension about returning to school, this is the time, you know, um, during the summer, we have a gift of time that we really need to invest in ourselves, invest in our families, invest in the things that that bring us joy and comfort, uh, because we need to return to school as restored as possible so we can face the challenges ahead. Yeah, I really like how you talked about your um view of of servant leadership and how, you know, seeking to understand, to help them unpack um, the situation and come up with solutions. Um, Not necessarily just going for the solution right away, like you would have in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because in this situation, you can't necessarily fix things, right? Um, You're doing your best to understand, like you said, you know, you know that they're feeling uh, frustrated about the distancing protocols and the masks. But um, I'll tell you, Dana, I was going to say, speaking for myself, I find, I find service to others a real stress reducer. Mm-hmm. So if, if I start uh, ruminating, uh, worrying, uh, getting into kind of you know, negative feedback loops, mm-hmm. it really helps me just to take a look around and say, okay, whose load can I lighten right now? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it gets me up out of my office. And so it's, it's uh, you know, personal connections with kids, with students. Um, if it's a dumb dad joke I can tell to a kid who looks a little bit down or if it's um, just a way to do something unexpected for, uh, for a teacher to lighten his or her load, mm-hmm. I find service gets me out of my own head and, and it's a tremendous stress, rel- stress reliever for myself. 
Uh, and I wonder how many of us, uh, if we reflect on that, find the same thing. It's, it's really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Now that's great to hear. Uh, let's shift a little bit and talk about uh, how you're helping uh, your stakeholders manage the information from the Provincial Ministry of Education. Uh, because in Ontario and throughout Canada, uh, the decisions for school opening are more um, on the provincial level as opposed to in the U.S. It's kind of a hodgepodge in the same metro area. We have schools doing all sorts of different things. So, um, kind yeah. of, you know, it, it, how, do, how does that there, work? With, you know, if, if you're in a metro area in Ontario mm -hmm. uh, with a higher case rate uh, as opposed to maybe a rural area with a lower case rate, but then the province decides for the whole um, province, everybody's going back. So how do you, how do you um, explain that to, to the stakeholders and help them kind of, um, you know, voice like what they're feeling and, and all that? It, it's definitely challenging because uh, all across the province and in different provinces uh, across Canada, um, you're right, it, it, it's, uh, it's provincial decisions uh, that have local impact when the, um, the, uh, the amount of community infection, the amount of community spread is very different uh, from a rural community, say in the northern Ontario to an urban community like uh, Toronto, uh, Pure Region, Mississauga, Chatham, or Windsor. Uh, here where I work in Waterloo Region, we're very fortunate uh, that our community infection rate and our community spread rate is very low. Uh, and it, um, it gives me confidence as a school leader to say, of course, we cannot guarantee safety uh, within uh, a global pandemic. All we can do is we can leverage uh, the, the, the public health uh, situation in our community mm -hmm. to our best advantage, knowing that we will make it as safe as possible. Uh, to prevent new infection uh, and to limit any spread if if the worst was to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in, in other high density areas uh, like the city of Toronto, um, uh, it they are they are right now um, working through their local boards and and boards of trustees to try to come to some um, some si a situation where the the risk continues to be mitigated. Uh, they're, um, they're trying to reduce class sizes. They are working to hire additional staff members. And so as school principal, it's, it's such a unique situation because you, you want to always frame um, the efforts of, of public education positively. And you always want to seek to uh, enhance public confidence in what we have to provide in terms of public education and, and locally. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I hope I'm speaking for all of my colleagues locally and across the province too. I, I am certain that everything that can be done at the local level is being done. Uh, and so when I have uh, families asking about safety, when I have colleagues asking about safety, um, I've been fortunate to be able to tune in to, um, uh, to our board meetings and, and hear trustees and, and, and hear their questions, um, examine the budgets, examine the, uh, the successes and, and the barriers. And so Staying informed uh, and, and helping to help families sort of come to terms with the reality as, as, it, as it exists today and to avoid speculating about what you don't yet know or, or couldn't ever begin to confirm. That's a, that's a constant balancing act. So, you know, as school leaders, we have a tremendous opportunity and responsibility to, to really hold and reframe information. And again, it, it's got to be caring but real. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you want to hold and reframe it for your community in a way that helps to uh, instill confidence wherever possible and just is, is real about the challenges as well. So um, here locally, like I said, I'm very pleased to say that uh, I, I think we are in as safe a situation as we can. And I certainly wish uh, my principal and school board colleagues across the province and, and, and all over North America, all over the world really, uh, the very best as they reckon with uh, state, uh, district, and, and, and local decisions that impact uh, how the schools run and how safe we can make it for kids. Because ultimately our goal has to be to restore schools uh, as places of safety, the, the same as they were uh, before COVID. So places of physical safety, places of social, emotional safety. Um, that That is what gives me hope. That's That's the little... That's, that's the vision that I keep coming back to if, if I begin to doubt myself or, or doubt our ability to do this. Uh, I come back to, we're going to restore our schools as places of safety, just like we were. We're going we're gonna to be there for our communities, just like we were. Uh, and we're going to grow confidence through practice, just like we did before COVID. Yeah. 
And you mentioned to me in the pre-chat a little bit about you're treating the return to school as a process as opposed to something that's etched in stone, right? Because I mean, things change all the time and, and we're all experiencing that. But um, I, I like how you're coming across with that positive attitude and you know, we want to be able to welcome our students in for that um, you know, emotional well-being for uh, you know, just the socialization and everything. And um, mm -hmm. you did say that there is a psychological barrier with elementary school students, right? Uh, keeping the distances. <laughs> so uh, do you for see sure. that as a potential issue? You said uh, one thing that was uh, interesting because in, in Toronto or in, in, in Ontario in general, they're saying distances should only be one meter. And I spoke to somebody who was going to school in Europe this uh, past spring, and they also said, the one meter distance is fine. Um, in the US they say, like there's no, there's nothing magic that happens between five and seven feet, you know, around two right. meters, but they all wanna be around two meters as opposed to one meter. So uh, do you think it's gonna be a, a big issue keeping the kids uh, the one meter apart? Yeah, so there, there's a couple of things that come to mind is, is up to this point in terms of, of public health management in Ontario, the <laughs> the yardstick or the meter stick, uh, for lack of a better question, has been two meters. We've been we've been cautioned to keep two meters or around six feet of difference between others. And so one of the things that's dissonant with educators and families is, okay, up to this point, um, we need to keep ourselves safe by maintaining a two meter distance. And now it's it's okay for one meter. Um, so one of the things that we uh, that we're we're coming to that we are going to need to come to realize in terms of welcoming kids back to the school buildings is two meters is something that we always want to strive for where we can. So uh, kids passing in hallways, um, uh, kids outside on the yards, so wherever we can maximize physical distancing of two meters or more, that's where we'll do it. Mm -hmm. If we cannot do that because of lack of space in the classroom or because naturally kids are going to want to they're going to want to reconnect with their friends. They're, they're going to want to hug and they're going to want to come together. And I, I think of our early learning classrooms, our, our, our kindergarten classrooms where, where coming together for play is that, that is the curriculum. I mean, that, that feeds kids brains, it feeds their hearts. And so, yeah, it, it's going to be challenging because uh, especially if we return to schools um, with that, uh, that sense of um, we need to enforce uh, physical distancing, like, um, we are going to have a real challenge on our hands because, you know, in terms of public health as citizens, we've been told, keep two meters away. Mm -hmm. As educators, we have to understand that kids and families are not going to necessarily return to school um, knowing or understanding how to do that, depending on their experiences during the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. and ultimately, schools are places of learning. Uh, they, they do have rules, they have expectations, they will have protocols, but we are not here to enforce a set of protocols with kids in a punitive way. We're, we're here to help them learn how to be as safe as possible. Same with parents. I mean, uh, parents are gonna wanna naturally uh, congregate, wish their children well as they return to school. Uh, of course, we want them to maintain physical distance where possible. We want them to keep safe. We wanna keep our school area safe as well. But um, if we approach our families with, uh, with, an, with an enforcement and, 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 um, and consequences model uh, of a series of thou shalt, that, that is going to do the opposite of what we need to do, which is to rekindle relationships. If the first exchange we have with a parent is reminding them to stay back and keep their distance, mm -hmm. they're going to take that away. They're going to remember that. If instead you, you kind of lead with the heart and, and just let people know, I'm delighted to see you. I, it's wonderful. How are you? And then if you can find a way to teach and help them to understand uh, what you're called to do as a school leader on behalf of the school board in terms of those safety protocols, that's the way to go. So we're going to continue to be places of learning uh, and uh, I'm going to do all I can to reinforce uh, to my staff and, and to instill confidence in behalf of our parents that kids are going to learn to do this better and better. And we are not in the enforcement and punishment uh, uh, model of helping kids to learn that that's going to have the opposite effect of what we're trying to achieve. No, I really like how, how you're uh, wording that. And, you know, we're, we're leading with the heart, right? I, went through the mm -hmm. training with Flip Flippin a couple of years ago, capturing kids' hearts and, uh, you know, talking about building those relationships with students, right? And, and not, not leading with the curriculum, not leading with, uh, you know, the, the goal of uh, the academic thing in mind, but you're leading with the heart. So that really spoke to me. Uh, tell me a little no, bit Nina, about- I think, 
sorry, no, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely possible to engage the heart through curriculum. And that's the intersection that we want to strive for is, is to, to know our learners so well that we're engaging their heart with what we ask them to accomplish on their own or together in classes. But uh, without that foundation, uh, with that, without that heart led foundation, that work is incredibly difficult because you get to know the kids needs, you get to know their strengths and opportunities for growth uh, by building those relationships. So yeah, we, that, that is and will continue to be our foundation. It's necessary. Great. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, your self regulation strategies as it applies to the school leadership setting. Um, you talked in the pre chat a lot about um, re framing and reframing um, energies and stresses. One of the one of the biggest takeaways for me through my self self reg learning um, uh, through the Merit Center uh, here in Ontario, Canada is 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 our ability to um, to reframe uh, I would say the successes and struggles of school life through a self reg lens. It's um, it's an approach where we consider what we're seeing. Um, in terms of a student's experiences, in terms of a student's behavior, and in fact, you know, the behavior of our friends and family, and and we ask, uh, why are we seeing what we're seeing, and and why are we seeing it now? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest transformations that that I've experienced and have been able to model and and, and help my staff experience again is 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 a is a is a definite shift away from uh, away from a, a, a punitive or consequences based approach to student behavior. So um, in, in some cases, uh, and, and this was my experience as a beginning educator, you, you have a, um, a list of classroom rules and consequences and you approach it in a very lockstep way. Mm -hmm. If this happens, then this happens. Um, what I'm learning more and more and what I, what I see just tremendous promise in is, is seeking to understand what we might characterize as student misbehavior Mm -hmm. If we characterize it and reframe it as stress behavior, um, students and all of us are experiencing just a wide number of stresses in our lives, stresses from outside, stresses from within, things that we can control, things that aren't within our control, uh, things that we can name and things that go unnamed. And so, uh, you know, the, one, of the, uh, one of the reframing approaches in, in terms of self-reg, uh, which, which leads, to a situ leads to situations where students have enough balance and enough support to, to self-regulate, to, to regulate their own behavior, to regulate their own emotional and physical needs. Um, by reframing and trying to reduce, identify and reduce stresses that students may be experiencing, rather than jumping to an immediate conclusion that a student or a colleague or a parent is necessarily misbehaving, um, it, by identifying and reducing stresses and, and taking a sort of a, a stress detective approach, by reducing stresses, you do a couple of things. One is that you demonstrate care through practice and service. Second, you position yourself as someone as is is someone who is is curious, who is seeking to understand, uh, rather than someone that is that is seeking to consequence or to punish. And, and third, it it puts us it puts us in a stance where um, we have the ability to to focus in more and more uh, on our students as individuals. Um, that operate within uh, a social structure within a classroom or within a, a cohort or within a division or within a school. So um, self-reg learning too has been really helpful in, in terms of my own approach to, to managing my own emotions, um, in terms of recognizing the stresses that I experience and, and reframing, could it be? Um, and approaching like all of my relationships with, with all of the stakeholders from, you know, from, from kids who are at three uh, to their parents, grandparents, and caregivers. It's just a matter of seeking to understand what people are experiencing before you can bring them alongside you to understand what you need them to, uh, to know or to do. Yeah, I, I really um, resonate with that because I remember as well as a beginning educator having that set of rules and you know, going over my expectations, right? And then I shifted it. Um, it was probably 13 years into teaching that I shifted having the students um, work with me on the um, code of conduct, as you will, right? Mm -hmm. Or the classroom contract, right? And, um, you know, having that shift uh, from punitive more to uh, collaborative, right? Um, and I really like how you talk about, um, you know, you want to approach um, uh, anybody, colleagues, uh, stakeholders, parents, students with gentleness, grace, and patience, right? 
um, you know, everybody has a time where, where they're going to be stressed. And um, you mentioned in the pre-chat, it's human to lose your cool, right? But you have to be able to forgive yourself and restore any damaged relationships that may occur as a result of uh, being stressed out and not uh, be able to self-regulate at the moment, right? But I think we're mm -hmm. always learning more, uh, you know, and taking the time to uh, attend trainings. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have done that um, during the quarantine period. They attend a lot of webinars and, and you know, maybe sometimes there are meditation webinars as well. I've, I've gotten a mm -hmm. lot of emails about it. And people, you know, learning more about themselves and how they react. I think that's key when you're, when you're in this type of service profession, right? One, uh, one key takeaway from self-reg uh, is that it, it's called self, like you, you self-reg, you can't reg someone else. Yes. So it begins, it begins with, with yourself and recognizing that in order to, to share calm that others may need, mm -hmm. um, you have to find your own first. And if you're not able to find it, that's, that's, that's perfectly human. That's perfectly understandable. But mm -hmm. it, it, in order to uh, help others uh, feel calm, uh, you have to find your own. So, so sharing calm happens um, quite unconsciously. It happens with our physical presence. It happens with our, our nonverbal cues like eye contact, uh, tone of voice, modulation, mm -hmm. uh, facial expressions. And one real challenge that we're going to be facing um, with, uh, with, uh, with the use of uh, personal protective equipment is um, some of our channels of, of self or co-regulation, some of the ways that we would normally cue safety and calm for our kids and colleagues are going to be interrupted by masks and face shields. And so um, I'm really hopeful that, um, you know, I, I want to learn through practice with my colleagues what, what's working for them in terms of, uh, of meeting those challenges of, of not being able to, uh, your, your child not, you know, your student not being able to see you smile or um, really being restricted in terms of providing physical comfort uh, to a kid that's upset. Um, I'm really curious to see how we're going to face those challenges. I know we will. Um, and again, it's, it's, um, it, these are some of the answers that are only going to emerge through practice. But as long as we maintain hope that we'll find them. And it, it, just like you said uh, earlier in the discussion, you know, the return to school is not going to be a one and done event. It's going to be something that unfolds. And, mm -hmm. and, and typically we measure progress day to day. We, we might need to learn to measure progress hour to hour or even minute to minute. Mm -hmm. And so if we, you know, our, our schools open Tuesday, the 8th of September, if we take a look back on the following Tuesday and then on the last Tuesday of that month and then the last Tuesday of the following month, we're going to see growth. We're going to see progress. Uh, and it, it's just, we, we just need as, as colleagues, friends, uh, loved ones and, and, uh, and leaders in our community, we just need to do all we can to, to maintain our own hope that things are going to be okay. And also to know that if things turn out not to be okay, uh, there are caring people that are going to know how to respond. Yeah, no, I like how you frame that. And, uh, you know, working with um, what we learn along the way, right? Um, maybe debriefing, as you say, the week after, or two weeks after, the month after, and, and, and seeing what we've learned, what, what, what's positive that we can take away, and maybe something that uh, didn't go so well, and that how we can change that. So that's, it's constantly evolving, as you say. Uh, well, I really enjoyed this discussion today. Out, out of everything we discussed on the podcast, what's one thing in particular you'd like listeners to remember? Um, wow. I, I mean, so much great conversation. And thank you again for inviting me to join you. Uh, I guess what I will say is that, you know, if we come back to the beginning of our podcast, this, 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 is, this is a... Um, an incredible in the trenches moment that all of us are, are either beginning to wade into, uh, depending on where you teach and learn, uh, or are about to wade into. So, you know, my, you know, what I hope folks listening take away is that um, all of us are are creating the best possible conditions that we can on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us have a responsibility to meet others where they are uh, and to rekindle and leverage the relationships you, that you've already established or that will need to be reestablished mm -hmm. uh, when we come back to school. Um, and finally, I mean, on one hand, uh, not to lose hope or if you are, if you feel you're losing hope, reach out to others who can help restore it. Mm -hmm. and, and also, as you said, give yourself patience and grace uh, so that you can recognize there are going to be setbacks and, and some of the setbacks may be significant. 
And some of the setbacks may be unexpected and some of the setbacks may in fact be traumatic. Uh, we just don't know yet. But mm -hmm. uh, what we do know is that if we maintain focus on restoring schools as, as places of safety, uh, just like they were uh, before the impact of COVID, um, and do all we can to leverage our community health uh, and public health advice and, and the advice of our school boards and, uh, and uh, um, support of our colleagues, uh, that again, I'm hoping that collective apprehensive breath is gonna be released as we just see the eyes of kids sparkling when they come back to school, as we see the relief in parents leaving kids in our care, as we hear back from parents that, yeah, we think that, we think that things are gonna be okay. Um, that's my message of hope to everybody listening. Great. Where can people find you online? Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Brad, B-R-A-D underscore Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. Uh, all my bio and, and uh, school contact information is there. I'd, I'd be delighted to connect with any listeners or viewers by Twitter. I, I've learned so much uh, through my Twitter uh, personal learning network and, and really enjoy the opportunity to come together with you for this, uh, for this podcast. Uh, and we welcome the chance to, to connect with anybody uh, with whom uh, our discussion resonates. Well, thank you so much. It was great chatting with you today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much.